today about the results of a research that I conducted in Catholic prison ministry in Victoria in 2014. And from my recent visit to two medium security prisons in the state of Wisconsin in the United States. Today I want to focus on the restorative practices employed by the prison ministry and the ways that it assists prisoners towards healing and transformation. While it may not be essential, I believe that if prisoners can reconnect with their faith and the spiritual and religious parts of themselves, this restorative process will be easier as they embrace the Christian message of hope and forgiveness. First of all, I would like to thank Kevin Slattery. I don't know if he's here today or not, but he's the Honorary Archivist for St Vincent de Paul, Victoria. And I want to thank him for sending me information about the Prison Visitation Scheme, which started in Victoria by the Society of the St Vincent de Paul in May 1936. The program was commenced after His Grace, the Most Reverend Dr Mannix, asked the Society to assist discharged prisoners. Over the next eight months remaining in 1936, there were 290 prisoners visited and 1,012 visits made. The prisons visited were Pentridge, Geelong Jail, Castlemaine Reformatory and prisoners who were ill at the Melbourne Hospital. Rosaries, prayer books, religious medals, catechisms were all supplied to those who required them. In the following year, there were concerts held in the jail and donations given of honey, jam, fruit and cheese for the prisoners at Christmas and Easter. Catholic papers were delivered into the various jails, um, jails and they also had football and cricket matches to go to French Ireland to play against the prisoners. I was really pleased to read this because my husband's father went to French Ireland to play cricket during that period and in the 1930s and I remember him telling me how greatly he was moved he was by that experience. The visitors also supply, supplied boots, coats, suits and other items to the men when they were released from prison to help them in their search for work. Other kinds of support was also provided. What a wonderful legacy started then and continues today by the society. You may not know that an order of Australia was given to Ian Bolsh in 2005 for 50 years of visitation to those in need. He visited prisoners in Victorian jails for 27 years. I have to say we have at least one Catholic chaplain in Melbourne, namely Sister Mary Carroll, who could match his long record for her work in prisons. And others in prison ministry have worked there almost as long. St Vincent de Paul continues with for this work today of which we are most grateful. Catholic prison ministry, which I'm going to talk to you about, commenced in 1989, 26 years ago, and was built on the work of the wonderful people who did visitations prior to this time. Now, let's see if I can manage this. In Catholic prison ministry, there are approximately 22 priests, 20 chaplains, that's both priests of religious orders and lay, and 60 volunteers from Catholic Prison Ministry Victoria operating statewide. They operate in all the prisons, which as you can see there, include 12 publicly orient, uh, uh, operated prisons, two private prisons, and one transition centre. When I conducted this study in 2014, there were 6,247 prisoners in Victorian prisons as of the 25th of July. Approximately 1,100 of those were Catholics, which is 18% of the prison population. This is an enormously large number of people for the Catholic chaplains and volunteers to assist. Well, now let's talk a little bit about my study. The background to the study was I was asked by Catholic Social v Services Victoria and Catholic Care Melbourne to conduct a study on the operations of the Catholic Prison Ministry. The purpose of the study was to provide information about and insights into the ministry in order to improve it and to increase awareness with and beyond the Catholic community 
about the work of this wonderful ministry. And there you can see um, a, a little quote that we've got from Sister Mary O'Shaughnessy about the rationale for the work. As part of um, the study, I interviewed a number of people, including ex-prisoners, family members, ordained chaplains, non-ordained chaplains, and four other people who had an association with the program. That, as I said before, I found the work of the <coughs> ministry so extraordinarily impressive and challenging that I got a little bit carried away and I was meant to finish this project in a very short time with many less people. But I'm afraid I still haven't um, stopped, which is why I'm still visiting prisons. Recently in my um, visit to the US, um, my husband told my granddaughter that grandma's overseas and she's in prison. <laughs> so, <laughs> they, they have many different roles, chaplains and volunteers, of which I'm going to run through them one by one. So there are many practical things that chaplains do. The emotional impact is the thing that prisoners most mess, mention most often, the religious and spiritual, the safe context and the whole restorative nature of their work, which is where I want to lead. Well, let's look at the practical work that they do. They help with filling out forms and you might say, well, why don't they get some of the people in prison, the guards or the other people in prison to help them. The reason is that they don't necessarily trust them. It's not that they don't have a lot of goodwill to do it, but it's the chaplains and the volunteers that they trust. They'll attend court, they'll liaise with other organisations such as St Vincent de Paul and Jesuit Social Services to support them and their families. They contact family members and they advocate. But today I'm mostly going to have on my slides the voices of the prisoners, the ex-prisoners and occasionally the volunteers and chaplains. So as I'm talking, you'll be able to see and hear their voices. As I said before, the emotional support that chaplains and volunteers provide was extraordinarily important to the prisoners. And as you can see by this comment written there, if there was some reason the chaplain wasn't there, I don't know what those women would do. The prison officer's role is quite separate. We met some beautiful and respectful prison officers as well, but their role doesn't allow for this kind of pastoral care. One of the reasons why it was so important is that the complete confidentiality that the chaplains and volunteers are the only people in the prisons who don't have to report something that has been said. Now, there's a bit of um, a proviso to that. If a prisoner is looking to harm themselves or to others, then they must report it. But everything else is confidential. And the prisoners know this. They said, you know when you tell a chaplain something, no one else will know, it will go no further. One of the other things that the prisoners told me was that it's very depressing, very sad and often very confrontational for them when they first go into prison and to have someone there who they can listen to and show their vulnerability is extraordinarily important. One of the prisoners said to me, Ruth, you can't show your soft side. If you show your soft side, someone will take advantage of it but you can tell the chaplains and the volunteers and you'll know they'll listen and they will understand. One of the other really important things that prisoners told me was that they are not seen as criminals. They are not defined by their crime by the chaplains and the ministry team. They are seen as part of God's creation, of someone who God loves and someone they are attempting to help and to love also. And this was greatly appreciated by the prisoners and was um, a base whereby they could hope for the future and change. And you can see there, she sees everyone as an individual and this helps adjustment. She doesn't judge anyone on race, crime or anything like that. 
She's always there. She made prison more bearable as always being there. Someone to talk to and someone who listens to. As I said, she helps them cope with prison life. If you can think about what it must be like to go to prison and to share a cell and with, be with people who you may not like very much and don't get on with very well and who you might even be afraid of, to have someone there who can support you, often the only person who you feel is, sees you as an individual and someone who can look inside and see the good person inside. Sister Mary O'Shaughnessy said to me, inside all of the prisoners is a good side, that they have done bad things, but they are not bad people. And this is a really important message for them. One of the other important things about having chaplains and, and volunteers there is at the time when the prisoners want to address their past and want to think about moving forward, or think about even reconnecting with their faith. They don't want to have to wait two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. They want to know that there's someone there that they can call on who will listen to them when they're ready at this critical moment in their lives. It's in your own time when you feel you need to speak to them or you're making a step in the right direction of your life. They are there to help you and that's what people need, especially prisoners. Oops, here I go again, but we're getting there. One of the things that I'm going to talk to you about restorative change today is that the chaplains and the ministry team provide a context whereby prisoners can start to think about change, can think about a better way and a better life. One of the men who um, I was talking to um, said to me, you know, there's, a, there's a, a, another prisoner who comes along to Mass and I don't like him very much. He's not really my sort of person and we wouldn't be friends. But he comes along here and he's one of us. So if he was in trouble, I'd try to help him. And if I knew that some gang or group in the prison was going to attack him, I'd make sure I'd try to defuse it. The men try in many ways to start to change. One of the men, and I'm going to talk to you a bit later about the um, visit I did in Wisconsin, but one of the men said, I'm trying to be a good friend to the other men in here. I think if you asked anyone else in this room, they would say they could come and talk to me and I would be loyal. And this comment down the bottom here, you can see someone already <coughs> starting to change. He acted as a minister to the other prisoners. He didn't seem like a prisoner, more like a chaplain. He's so outgoing and so helpful. In order to change, prisoners need to be able to enhance their self-worth. I talked to one um, former prisoner who said to me, when you go to prison, your sense of self is destroyed. Your sense and self-esteem is reduced. And he said, everyone needs to have self-esteem, Rose. If you can't get it by being a good person, you are going to get it by being the best prisoner, the best prisoner and the best criminal. And prison's a good place to teach you how to be a very successful criminal. And this man, who had totally turned his life around on the outside, recognised that part of the ministry helped him in terms of reframing himself. When he arrived in prison, he was full of guilt and shame. But he said the ministry helped him to deal with that and see that he had a positive contribution to make to life. And you can see the, uh, some of the comments there. One of, I think, the most shocking things that I found in the study was out of the ex-prisoners who I talked to and also when I talked to family members was how depressed a lot of the people were who were in prison and how many of them wanted to self-harm. 
In fact, almost all the former prisoners I talked to said that they had suicidal thoughts while in prison and three of them said I would be dead by now if it was not for the ministry of the chaplains. And you can see that last quote there. She's unbelievable. She's like someone who's been sent down to help us, someone who is very different. One of the other important areas is the spiritual and religious support that's given to prisoners. They provide comfort and renewal. They help them to deal with guilt and to seek and find forgiveness. And they help them to reflect and develop empathy. All these things are really important for the men and women in prison if they are going to restore themselves to some kind of way that is useful to society and to themselves. And I think that little comment down the bottom is really interesting. The only ray of light I had there was I had the chaplains come in and I rediscovered my faith. Out of the men and women I interviewed, only one of them had been a regular mass attendant before they went to prison. Mass attendance in prison is very high, much higher than in the um, outside life. But many of the men who had been baptised, gone to funerals, weddings and church attendance occasionally beforehand, started attending and many of them rediscovered their faith of former days. They wanted to reconnect to that earlier value system. I remember one man telling me that when he came in, he hadn't been to Mass for a long, long time, but he went along and he wanted to really reconnect. And he said he was very depressed. He felt terribly guilty. He realised he let his family, his workplace and his community down. And he said the chaplain gave him a little prayer card and on one side was a prayer and the other side was a picture of Jesus. And he said it was the only thing in his cell that he had to console him. And every night he read the prayer and looked at the picture and that was the start of the journey. Part of the journey if they're going to really try to restore, seek forgiveness, is to, first of all, they have to accept prison life. Many men are very angry when they come into prison and they easily get into um, infractions and fights. One of the things I'm not going to talk to you at length about today is that the men and women who go to mass and join in as part of the chaplaincy program that's in prisons, they are less likely to commit infractions. Infractions are fights and um, disruptions and rule violations and there are a whole range of reasons for that. But part of it is to accept you are in prison, you have committed a crime and you need to be able to adjust to it. And this is part of the journey that um, the ministry program has helped help the men to find some calm in their life, to find a way to deal with the anger about being in prison as the first step in moving forward. A second step is to show remorse for the crime, to accept they have done it, and it has hurt other people. It's hurt the victim, it's hurt their families, the wider community, and it has hurt themselves, if for no other reason than they're in jail rather than outside. And the, they need to acknowledge that as part of their journey and to be able to show remorse and to seek and receive forgiveness. And certainly the men and women that I talked to showed and discussed with me these various things. And here's a really nice quote from an ex-prisoner here. But the last time I needed her was I came to realise that my life of this sort of industry was over. She actually took me to church and we had a talk and it changed my way of thinking. We had a reading and some prayer. I have to say, if any of you have ever been to Mass in a prison, it's an extraordinarily moving thing to do. I was immensely grateful for being invited. That 
the men and the women are, are more involved than the people in your normal pews. First of all, they all sing and sing with gusto. The men and the women help set up the chapel. They help organise the music and make sure the music is all set up and ready to go. They help set up the room. They do the readings, volunteer to do the readings, and they also have extemporary prayer. When I went to the women's prison and um, we had extemporary prayer and every single woman in the room prayed. Now, I thought that they would pray, can God let me have a lesser sentence or get remand or can I be out soon? But they didn't, not one person prayed for that. They prayed for the Syrian refugees. They prayed for their children. They prayed for the people who were ill. And I was greatly moved by that. And I was greatly moved by the opportunity to talk to the men and women um, just before and also after the service. I'm going to really talk to you now about the whole restorative ministry. Uh, this is the covert is a researcher and um, also a chaplain who I took this quote from, the prison environment invites a transforming reflection. So what's restorative justice about? I'm not going to talk much about restorative justice. I'm going to talk about restorative practice. But sometimes restorative practice and restorative justice are used interchangeably. And they have some differences that I want to just point out so you're clear about what I'm talking about. Restorative justice has three primary stakeholders. That is the victims of a crime, the offenders of a crime, and their communities of care, the people around them that they might have also harmed or been involved. And the quote there, it describes what it is. Restorative justice is a process whereby all the parties with a stake in a particular offence come together to resolve collectively how to deal with the aftermath of the offence and its implications for the future. And part of this is setting up so that the offender and the victim meet with a mediator. Normally, the mediator would meet with one of the people first, maybe the um, victim, and ask what they wish to get out of the mediation. Then they would meet with the perpetrator of the crime and talk about what they would, and they, then they would set up a meeting to try to find some way to restore the harm that has been done. That does occur in some prisons, but it does not occur in the ministry program um, in Victoria. In some prisons, they do actually bring the actual victim in, in one of the programs that I did hear about was not quite the same, but the prisoners were asked to think about the people they had harmed and to write letters to them. Whether the letters were posted or not um, was really up to a decision about whether that was a, an effective thing to do, but it was healing in its own. Restorative practice is, is already being done in the prisons, as I've talked about. One of the first things that you need to be able to do is to develop empathy for others, including the victims of crime. And that's quite often quite a lengthy process. It's also accepting that your crime has impacted on other people and hurt other people. In order to do this, as I said before, you need to have increased self-worth. And you need to have a desire for reconciliation and for change and then to restore the self to a position where you feel you're an okay person. Well, how does the ministry do that? They help them to acknowledge the hurt, they help them see that they have a potential for goodness, they help them to show remorse and contrition, and they provide through the religious services and by um, the ministry itself forgiveness and hope for the future.
So the process involves, first of all, having a safe context. The prisoners told me that the most safe place and the place where they feel calmest is in the chapel. It's the only place in prison where there are no guards. And they go there and they immediately find a place at peace, a place where they can sit and reflect. And that's really central to being able to move forward. They also find it a really safe place to be in the company of the chaplains and the prison visitors. In a way, they feel like it calms them and they also help provide strategies that help them to, to, to fuse some of their own anger. And as I said, I have run through various aspects of that. But now I want to move on to talk about someone that not only has does it in prison, but actually has set up a program whereby prisoners can learn it step by step by step. As I said, such a program, as far as I know, does not exist in Victoria. As I said before, I visited two medium security prisons in the US this year. I visited Fox Lake Correction Institute and New Lisbon Correctional Institution. Each prison contains a, a thousand male prisoners, most of whom have lengthy sentences. Their chaplaincy program is completely different to us in the state of Wisconsin where I was, in that the state pays the salary of one chaplain per prison and you apply for that prison. Eight religious groups can apply, including pagan. I found that a rather odd. And there is a pagan chaplain in the state of Wisconsin. That person organises for all the other religious groups to come in and to run their programs. In the two prisons that I visited, at the first prison, which was um, Fox Lake Correction Institution, a Native American woman was the chaplain there. She had been in prison herself for a, a significant period of time. She was converted while she was in prison, joined the Episcopalian Church. When she got out, she studied to be a pastoral uh, worker, studied for the ministry, and um, started to run family violence programs. She was asked by the prison warden, who's like our prison governor, to come and to be the chaplain at that prison. And she's doing an amazing job. The second one uh, um, where I went at New Lisbon, she was from the Christian Evangelical Church and they arranged for all the other denominations to come in, including Catholic. The program that's being run in Wisconsin, which is the rest called the Restorative Justice Program, was started in 2006 by the Reverend Jerry Hancock from the First Congregational United Church of Christ in Medicine. He, he interestingly enough, was a prosecuting uh, um, lawyer in America and then realised that's not what he wanted to do and studied for the ministry and has become a firm advocate uh, since then. What he did was decide that in order to make those fundamental changes to the men and women, they needed to have a lengthy program. And they have a program that um, runs for eight weeks and um, in the third week there are sessions on three days, two hours in the morning and two hours in the afternoon for three days. And I went to one of the sessions and I'm going to talk to you about it today. And so... Um, the men, there are 25 men who can apply to get in. There, they have to be approved by the prison, what we would call governor, but the, um, and also the chaplain. And there is no reward for coming. You do not get anything off your sentence or anything else, and they have to commit to going to all, all of the sessions. The, the men 
come and the chairs are all laid out in a circle. When I went, there were names on all the chairs, including mine. And um, I'm going to just briefly explain to you the um, program which I found particularly interesting. The victims of crime have asked if they will volunteer to come in and to tell their story to the men and women. They, this is the three-day program. They are not the same victims as the men who are in the program. So, for example, a woman who had witnessed her mother being viciously murdered offered to come in and she talked to the men about the impact on her family and herself and the men are invited to respond. And when I describe the program I'll, I went to, you would get, you'll get an idea of what it is. Um, the, so she would, this woman came in for six sessions, two on each day, and the men responded. Another woman who had been viciously raped came in and the men uh, said things like, well, I remember my sister was raped and how terrible that was. This is to help them develop remorse. Well, the program that I went to, um, I would have really liked to have gone to the session um, um, about when the visitors came in, but um, instead I went to the program where this week was entitled Jumping Mouse. So I'll just describe what happened. I arrived and as I said, the chairs were all set up for the 25 men with my uh, name on one of the chairs. All the men came and shook my hand first and welcomed me. And I have to say that when I left, the men um, um, asked if they could write to me and thank me for coming. And two days ago, I got the letters from the men who thanked me and said how much it meant that somebody had given up what they thought was my vacation to come and talk to them and how much they appreciated what I said. So the room was set up and we all were sat down and first of all we were all asked in one word how we were feeling um, and you weren't allowed to use the same word and people went and most of them were really optimistic about what they said. One man muttered he was bored. When we went round at the end of the two hours and asked how we were now feeling, their words were even more optimistic at, than at the beginning. And the man who said he was bored said, I'm not bored anymore, I now feel hopeful for the future, which was sort of really interesting. So the first thing they asked us to do in this was to go around and talk about a time when we had been respected and when we hadn't been respected and what was the consequence. They had a little soft toy and they handed you the soft toy when they were speaking and you couldn't speak unless you had it but everybody was to speak. And I was really quite moved because one man um, said, he said, I had a, fa a wonderful job, wonderful family, I'd never been in any trouble and one day a man was not respectful to me so I killed him and he said in those 30 seconds I lost my life, I'm here for life and my family was ruined, destroyed. So my lesson from this is if somebody's disrespectful for you, to you, walk away. So we, after that, um, one of the, this is all run by volunteers, the whole program by volunteers even though the paid chaplain who was... Um, this was from the woman who was from a um, um, more fundamentalist Christian church. She was there um, and obviously I was there, but one of the volunteers um, had prepared an activity which was on Jumping Mouse. Now, Jumping Mouse is a Native American fable. And basically, I'm just going to quickly tell you the story. This mouse wants to go on a journey for the beautiful mountain beyond and um, he can't get over the river, but a magic mouse gives him the power to jump so he can cross the river. And he meets animals along the way, and each one of the animal has some kind of disability problem. And in, there's also a snake, which is the, the snake um, swallows his very fat, lazy friend. But he, he meets, for example, a bison 
who is blind because he drank water from the river. And so the, the mouse, who's now also magic, gives his sight to the um, bison, and the bison helps him move to the next area. He then meets a wolf, and the wolf's lost his sense of smell. He gives his sense of smell to the, to the bison, and the bison moves him across to the promised land. And when he gets there, the frog's waiting for him and says, I know you have lost your sight and you've lost your smell, but you can jump and jump up in the air and he turns into an eagle. So that's the story. They've been told they have to, they have, to have volunteers, eight volunteers for the eight parts, and the volunteer has brought ears, nose, all kinds of dress-ups, and the men go off and dress up to prepare for the play, which she's written the script, while I um, am in another activity for the men um, with the group that's left behind. When they come back, they act the play with gusto. They've been told to act out and ham it up. They're terrific. And a lot of these men are not highly literate and they had trouble reading the script, but someone else would come along and help them. So um, then we all sat down again and were asked to go around and say who we identified with. And they went around and one man said, I was the snake. I went around hurting people, but I'm now trying to be the mouse on a journey. A number of people, men said, I was like the bison, I'd lost my sight and I'm hoping to regain it. So when it came to me, I know I've got to stop any minute and I want to go on just for a bit longer, um, I talked about times when I felt I was blind and might have hurt people and how really through my faith I had been able to gain my sight and I gave them examples and this was what I think stirred the men to write to me. And in the letters which I have here, they said it moved us so much to know you were just like us. All right. So um, this was... Then we did some more activities. This was an amazing sort of experience for me and an example of what you can do in prison. One of the other aspects for self-restoration is to make sure that the prisoners can relink with their families. So support from family members is essential. The chaplains do make a, a real effort to provide support for families. They make sure they're not being manipulated by the prisoners, but the wives, husbands, mothers and fathers of children spoke to me in my study and they talked about how difficult it was to do prison visits, how it was so much unknown and how the chaplains were there walking with them on the journey. And the prisoners also said it was so helpful to know there was someone keeping an eye on their family. She's great. She was great with talking to my mum and the kids and everything. She was really good. Goodness me. This is... Here we are. I hope I'm good. So one of the other things that I did want to talk to you about was helping prisoners once they get outside. And I know St Vincent de Paul and Jesuit Social Services help. But one of the areas that the ex-prisoners and their families told me that they were disappointed in was that they didn't feel parishes were welcoming of the prisoners. And there can be some good reasons for that. A lot of the men who get out, they may have... Um, mental health issues, they may also um, have reverted to being on drugs and alcohol, but they may not have also. There are some very good people coming out. And while the prison chaplaincy can never claim that it's linked to prisoners giving up crime, and many of them will go back, but some of them won't. And whether they do or they don't, they need the support. So what I'm really trying to encourage um, um, the ministry to do is to think about how you would do this. Because we are called to serve. And um, if we look at this um, statement here, it offers a privileged forum for bearing witness once more to Christian concern for social issues. I was in prison and you came to me. I've got some questions to leave with you. I don't expect you to answer them. But there needs to be more people working, more people volunteering, 
and I would encourage you to think about it. It's a wonderful experience. It's not scary. It's, it's tremendously rewarding. So how can we recruit more chaplains and volunteers? There are increasing prison numbers. Also, with the increased numbers, where's the money going to come from? The church certainly puts in some of the money, but we really need to have the funds to meet the increasing demands of the ministry program. What's going to happen when the religious who do an enormous task in terms of prison ministry, when they are no, low, are no longer able to serve. And how can we make people within the church aware of the work of chaplains and its impact? And lastly, what can we do to support priests and parishes to be more welcoming? What can we do to safeguard the health and safety of the people and their children while still being welcoming? and making them feel like they are part of the Universal Church. Thank you.